In this video, we're going to be looking at significance tests for means. It's going to be really similar to significance tests for proportions, so a lot of the four-step process is going to seem like it's being repeated, and that's because it is. All right, example one here is based on this game that I don't know if they sell anymore, but it was called Don't Break the Ice. Um, you just had these little plastic hammers, and you would like knock out one ice cube at a time and try not to get the, the guy to fall. There were some great games in the 90s. I don't know do they, if they still make this one. I can remember that commercial vividly. But anyway, a machine that produces those little plastic cubes for Don't Break the Ice is designed to make cubes that are 29.5 millimeters wide. Um, but it's a machine. It's not going to be exactly perfect. There might be some variability depending on the material being used or whatever. They want to ensure that the machine is working well, so a supervisor inspects a random sample of 50 cubes every hour and measures their width. We have the summary statistics from one of those samples below. The question is, is there convincing evidence that the mean width is not 29.5 millimeters? So before we get into actually doing any calculations, this is a four-step process question, so we're going to start with our first step, the state step. Our null hypothesis has to be the status quo or what we think is true, and that's definitely um, that the machinery is working. So our null is going to be that mu equals 29.5. Now here they say, um, is there convincing evidence that the mean width is not 29.5? They don't care if it's greater or smaller. Either way, the game won't work. If the cubes are too big, they won't fit into the holder. And if they're too small, they won't hold each other up. So it's kind of important that they are the right size. So our alternate is just not equal to, mu not equal to 29.5. Just like with proportions, I want you to say what that mu represents. So where mu is the true mean width of the plastic cubes. If you don't include that sentence, I don't know what you're talking about when you just say mu equals something. And like always, we're going to choose our significance level before we start. Let's just do 0.05 because they didn't specify, so we'll just do a standard significance level. Okay, the plan step is going to seem very familiar. Um, we start out by saying the sample was randomly selected. Um, that means we'll be able to generalize to the population of all cubes, which is the whole point of doing this significance test, so that's good. Next, we have to check the independent condition. We can assume that there's more than 500 cubes being made in an hour. And then lastly, we have to check the normal condition. Now remember, we're back to means now. For proportions, we are checking NP and N1 minus P. For means, you just have to use the CLT. If n is greater than 30, which in this case it is, the sampling distribution is approximately normal by the CLT. Um, if it was less than 30, you would have to check to make sure there's no strong skewness. And if you get something where you're not quite sure, like if there is some strong skew when you make a graph, you can always say, um, this isn't approximately normal, but we'll proceed with caution and then do the rest of the problem. I would always opt for that. If you think a condition isn't met, do the problem, and then at the conclusion you can say, however, we should be cautious because this condition wasn't met. The reason being that questions like this are usually worth a lot of points, and if you just stop before you even get halfway done with the problem and you're like, oh, I can't do it, it's really hard for your teacher to give you partial credit because you didn't do anything. <laughs> so do the whole problem, and then if you thought a condition wasn't met, you can always say, we should be cautious. Okay, now, just like with proportions, I like to make a diagram. So approximately normal, and the mean of this sampling distribution is 29.5. This is the sampling distribution if we were to assume that the null is actually true. Before we get to do, like before, I'm just going to calculate my standard deviation. Why not? However, we don't know sigma, so this is really the standard error of the sampling distribution of x bar. So um, I take the standard deviation from the sample, the 0.093, divide it by root 50, there's my standard error. If it seemed like the camera angle and the lighting changed just now, it's definitely not because I'm re-recording this later because I made a mistake. Okay, so as I just said, we're not using sigma, we're using the standard deviation from the sample. So just like we did with confidence intervals, um, we're going to use a t distribution instead of a z distribution for this. So somewhere in your plan step, you should write, we will do a T test. It's generally a good idea in your plan step to say what kind of test you're doing. So for means, if you don't know the standard deviation of the population, which you probably don't, 
you're going to do a t-test. So I've stated that here, we will do a t-test. So now in the do step, I'm calculating t, that's my um, statistic minus the mean over the standard deviation, I get negative 0.76. And because our alternate was not equal to, I'm interested in both tails. This is a two-sided test. So I'm going to use TCDF to find the area under the curve. Lower negative 1,000, upper negative 0.76. And then remember for TCDF, it asks you for degree of freedom. Our sample size was 50, so degree of freedom is 49. And then notice I'm multiplying this by 2 because I'm interested in both tails. So we get a p-value that is quite large. 0.451. Now for the conclusion, the probability of getting this x bar or something more extreme in either direction, that's important, if the null were true, also important, is 0.451. This is much larger than our significance level, so we fail to reject the null. We do not have convincing evidence that the mean width of cubes is different than 29.5. So very similar to the significance test for proportions, but with means, just remember, if you know sigma, you can use a z test. If you don't know sigma, which is much more likely, use a t test. If only I could remind my past self to do that. There's actually an interesting relationship between a two-tailed test and a confidence interval. So I wanted to mention that really quickly instead of going over a whole nother example, because I feel like it's a little repetitive. So this is the relationship between a two-sided test and um, a confidence interval. When we do a two-sided test at level alpha, let's say, and we fail to reject the null, I'm just going to call it mu equals some number, then the 1 minus alpha confidence interval will contain that number. So let's think of this using an example instead of all these symbols. If we do a two-sided test at, let's say, 0.05 as our significance level, and we fail to reject the null of mu equals 29.5, like in the last example, the 95% confidence interval would contain 29.5. If we're failing to reject the null, we haven't found convincing evidence that the mean is different than our number, we are 29.5, which means that 29.5 is going to be in the interval if we were to make a confidence interval. If we're failing to reject the null, we haven't found convincing evidence that the mean is different than our number, which means that 29.5 is going to be in the interval if we were to make a confidence interval. And then the reverse of that is true as well. When the two-sided test at the significance level alpha rejects the null, same thing, mu equals a number, then the 1 minus alpha confidence interval will not contain the number. So if we did that exact problem again, um, but let's just say that we concluded we do have enough evidence to reject the null and conclude that the mean is different than 29.5. 29.5 would not be in our interval if we were to make a confidence interval. So that's the relationship between a two-sided test and a confidence interval. And this relationship only works for the two-sided test, because if you think about a confidence interval, a certain amount of the data is in the center or the middle of the distribution, and then we have two tails. So this logic doesn't really work if you're just looking at greater than or less than for your alternate. It only works if you're dealing with not equal to. When in doubt for these, try to draw a picture. Um, think back to that applet where we had the true mean and we had the intervals. Sometimes they would catch and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, don't try to memorize this. Just try to think through it logically. How many times have I said don't memorize this? It's a lot. You have brains. You can use them. <laughs>